It's uh, my pleasure to, to continue uh, the talks and introduce our next uh, speakers. Uh, we're going to now shift to uh, several early applications and stunning applications of functional MRI. And I, uh, I'm a little bit um, biased, uh, but uh, I actually was a latecomer to this field, actually, of fMRI research, because I was in one of the uh, leading pet laboratories at the time. And I remember all of these breakthroughs coming through. We remember seeing the science paper uh, uh, of Jack's and, and, and suddenly paying uh, attention, you know, or, you know, suddenly, wow, you can do this potentially with another technology. And then the, the, the key paper showing that bold and intrinsic contrast agent uh, could allow anybody to do these techniques and do them extensively over time, many, many times potentially in a safe way. Uh, we knew this was important. Um, but being the conservatives we are, I, I could tell you we had many thoughts about why it wouldn't work. We had many reasons why this just couldn't go anywhere. And actually, it was the work that, was, that you're going to be hearing about and the investigators you're going to be hearing from that actually caused us to realize that this was the future. Um, specifically, uh, Roger's work in the visual system uh, with uh, uh, Anders and, and Marty and showing that you can unravel uh, the intricate details of visual cortex caused us to realize that this was a technique that could be applied and learn things about brain structure and function. And also, John Gabrielli's work, uh, many of you might not be aware of these early papers in the mid-90s, uh, in some sense they were modest by today's standards, which showed just a few uh, uh, sections in frontal cortex that you can use these techniques to see dynamics in higher order cognitive function uh, was the specific paper, at least for me, that caused me to jump ship and get in a flight to Boston. And then when I got here, Chantel was leading, Chantel Sternhill you'll be hearing from, was leading uh, path-breaking work showing how you can use these new techniques to study higher order cognitive function. Um, uh, and so it's actually a privilege to me. I did not pick the speakers, but uh, uh, it is the case that the, the investigators here will be hearing from uh, personally influenced my work. So without uh, uh, any more delay, I want to introduce Roger who um, uh, uh, came to this field actually uh, was already uh, leading the world and doing work and showing how the visual cortex was organized in monkeys and actually had one of the most remarkable visual demonstrations of topographic organization in visual cortex. And one other thing, uh, theme that you'll, you'll see in these talks is the first people to jump ship and use these techniques came from other areas. Um, and pardon the pun, uh, these were bold investigators who left very fruitful careers to actually embark on this sort of unknown of using functional MRI to explore the brain, and, 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 and Roger was one of these uh, very early pioneers. Roger. Hello, oh, yeah, I, I'm so glad to speak with you all. I'm also um, a little humbled by all the previous talks um, because I sort of, I mean, I came at this sort of by chance because I happened to be working across the street and, uh, you know, the experiments were hard. Uh, and I so, came across a, a preprint of Jack Bellavow's article and then I heard about Ken's upcoming stuff. So I, I just sort of rushed across the river and started doing, following what they did. But I had, the illusion that they sort of went in the lab and just did these experiments, I hadn't quite realized all the background. So it's, it's instructive to, uh, to hear about that. So I've, because I came about a year later, I'm 
calling my talk HBM 24, but it's still a long time, it seems like, often. Oh, how do you advance it, like this? All right. Okay, so as, as I mentioned, um, when I was when in 1991-92, um, there was a lot known about the visual cortex in animal models, and uh, it, the visual cortex. It it's no accident that that Ken and Jack may have used this system because it's it it takes up like about a third or a quarter. I mean, a third or maybe a half of. Uh, the visual cortex, just the visual processing. It's complicated, it's our primary sense, uh, but yet nothing basically was known about it in the human. And, you know, that's fine in some ways, but in fine, if you think of like where our money comes from, the Department of Health and Human Services, it's not called the Department of Health and Animal Services. You know, it, eventually it has to bring it back around to the human. And because our visual sense has evolved so in such a sophisticated way, it's also possible that, or likely that the animal models aren't quite exactly accurate. So in any event, that was what I was hoping to do. And also, you know, it turns out the fMRI is so much easier than messing around with uh, all these other difficult things. So I was hoping um, that this would kind of, the fMRI in human would kind of give us a way out of, of what I had done earlier. Um, so, when I began with Ken, uh, Ken was the guy who, uh, who really helped me learn the fMRI and has helped so many others. Um, initially, our results were kind of iffy. You know, he, he knew how to activate visual cortex, and I was trying to figure out what parts of visual cortex was activated and what those different areas did. So uh, initially, the results were kind of iffy, but then uh, about 1995, a lot of the studies we were doing kind of panned out, and one of them was this study that I'll show you a little bit of. Uh, it came out in Nature, and I'll talk about the results, but one thing to notice is it came out May 11th, and the very next day, we got out a paper in Science uh, on, the, on, the, on the 12th of May. So that was kind of a cool coincidence, but I've never been able to replicate that feat. It'd be nice, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Actually, a good week would be, would really do my career a lot. So I'm just going to talk about four things, partly in the interest of time. Um, I'm going to talk about the two studies I just showed you the titles of, the visual motion illusion and the retinotopic mapping. And both of them were quite novel, um, you know, partly just because of chance, partly because, you know, we're all so brilliant, I guess. And then I want to talk about what's really, I find much more exciting, which is the high-resolution mapping of these things. So, um, you just you know, this is just a standard fMRI experiment, or things that are standard now. Subjects are lying in the scanner, looking up at a visual stimulus. I'll just be talking about the sensory aspects. So they're not doing anything. You know, it doesn't matter what they're doing with their mind. Uh, you know, it's not cognitive. That came later by uh, Randy Buckner and many other people. So, as I said, this is I'll first talk about this experiment now. Um, how do I get this going, the movie? Uh, I don't know how to, I don't see a, oh, okay, there you go, okay, thanks. So yeah, so on this, for this experiment, I'll, I'll just keep talking, you just all stare at the, the red dot there. So <laughs> what we start thing is, is um, Visual illusions, they're interesting because they sort of tell you how the system breaks down. You know, like, if you just see things, that's fine, but if you see things that aren't there, like in a visual illusion, uh, what you should have seen is the, the stimulus, if you're staring at it, it'll now appear to contract a little bit. Um, so this is a, a visual illusion that was known even by the Greeks. Keep looking at it. Um, and it's called also the waterfall illusion because if you stare at a waterfall, 
the waterfall seems like it's going down, and then if you look around at the succeeding at the uh, nearby landscape, it seems like it's going up. So it's just basically what happens is in the visual area, uh, things kind of poop out, and then as, as you keep looking at direction and a single direction, and then sort of what you get is is the background activity coming in again. So anyway, we were looking at this. We're, this is the part of the illusion that's the control. So that shouldn't lead to a motion after effect. So um, this is really, when I look back on it, I can't remember why the brain was purple. But we thought it was a brilliant idea to make it purple. I think we, you know, frankly, I think we're trying to hide, you know, I don't know, I was looking for a dot or something. Anyway, it, it's perfectly valid data, but it's purple. So, um, and this is, it turned out, I mean, we were kind of the first ones to look at this area, but it's, it's the area that's, in animals, it looks like it's the area that, that where the cells respond really strongly to a single direction of motion, but not to others, and then different cells within that area respond to different directions of motion. So it would be a perfect place to give you a direction illusion. You know, it's like each of those cells tuned to expanding, um, kind of poops out over when you look at the stimulus, and then it shows a contraction. But it certainly wasn't known at the time that it did this. So this just shows the subtraction of conditions that um, where the fMRI actually, this is when the stimulus was moving, and in both the control condition where it's moving back and forth and the condition where it's moving in one direction, those produced strong activation, but it canceled out in this subtraction. But in, in this, the stationary condition afterwards, which you saw, um, that's where you see the perceptual illusion, and we measured the perceptual illusion here in the boxes, this is the strength of the illusion. It seems like it's contracting again uh, really strongly, and then it kind of fades away as, as the neural system recovers. Um, and it turned out that the fMRI in this area also showed a peak there and, it re in a, and a recovery approximately at the same time course as the perception. So that was um, cool, and uh, they liked it. So now I'll talk about the second study that came out then. And this was really done mostly by uh, Marty Sereno and Anders Dale, uh, although I helped a little. And I jumped on for senior author, because they, they didn't really know that a senior author was a thing at the time. So that was lucky for me. <laughs> they thought it was like the last, you know, really. So I said, sure, I'll be it. So, and I'm not going to belabor. The, the details are a little bit complicated. You know, everybody thinks retina hoppy is cool, but they don't understand it. Basically, the bottom line is if you put a stimulus anywhere in the visual field, you know, in a specific place in the visual field, like let's imagine this place here, you know, coated in orange. There actually was no orange stimuli, but, you know, um, it's coated here. Then it'll show up in these orange places in cortex. And conversely, if you put it here or blue here, then it'll show up in the blue places of the cortex. And so there's two things I want to show. And then I want to show some actual retinotopy uh, using modern techniques. I mean, the key here is that it was cool enough for science at the time because nobody had shown anything, but it's really pretty cloudy, you know, if you just look at it. But one of the key steps that Marty and Anders were able to do is that, you know, they could show this fMRI activity on, like, a regular brain, a reconstruction of a regular brain, and then, then they go through the step of going, say, they, they called it going from a raisin to a grape, you know, where you kind of puff up the brain, the cortex being known to be kind of a sheet. So you puff it up like sort of a ball, and you keep track of where the sulci and gyri were with the, the two grade codes. And then you can even flatten it completely. And that was good because it really shows you a map, like the cortex is a two-dimensional, I mean, a, basically a, a sheet of gray matter. And you don't really care what the white matter is doing, because that's just the connections between it. But to see the map that's in the cells, then it's really helpful to do this kind of thing, the cortical surface mapping. And of course, Bruce Fischel and everybody have carried force this, so it's kind of a standard now in the, in, the, in the Martino's group and in many other groups. So like I said, I won't bother you with the details, because I'll show them to you at, uh, in much better, in a much more elegant way. But the key is that this was you know, done on a 1.5 Tesla scanner, and uh, it was good for the time, but we suspected that, based on animal models, that the retinotopic map was actually quite much more specific than that. And so we did an experiment to try and, uh, try and show that. Um, 
now using a 7T. Mostly these experiments are done by Shaheen Nasser with some help from John Polamini, again at the center. Okay, yeah, this one. Okay, so again, we had subjects just staring at the center here, and basically we would activate different parts of the visual field. And these so-called polar angles, you know, the rays, activate uh, different parts of each visual area. Now, it's known that, like, primary visual cortex has a complete map of the visual field, uh, ending at the vertical meridian, and then the next area is like a mirror duplication of that, as if you took a Xerox and flipped it over. And the key is that all these areas are bordered by either the horizontal or the vertical meridian. So we're, we're trying to map that out. So this shows one of the maps from, again, from a seven Tesla. Um, and you can see it's very clear. You know, the maps you can see, they're sort of parallel lines. This is striate cortex, which is the area that Ken and Jack, uh, mostly Ken, uh, sampled. And then there's this other area that you can, you can find the borders here by just looking at the map. The borders are very exact. I don't know why this is so hard. Okay, so anyway. So this just shows you can toggle between and see that there's a oblique meridians that we're mapping and then the vertical and horizontal, and you can see how they differ. You know, so it's it's really a nice map that hadn't been seen before. And this, again, just shows, you know, if you, when you flatten it, you can see all the different areas. And so, I mean, in some ways, that's like, you know, retinotopy is sometimes boring for people because it's like, you know, it's very exact, it's lovely, but, you know, what does it mean? And it turns out these different areas do different things, and they have different columns in it and stuff. So that's the key to the next, the next and final section of the talk, which is looking at cortical columns. So the key is that, like, basically, you know, 99% of conventional fMRI, it looks at kind of these sort of cloudy regions uh, of activity, you know, somewhere in the brain. But at least in visual cortex, you know, where you have these nice discrete areas, each area does something different. And it's not that, you know, area X, you know, V2 does something, does something, it actually does different column-based things within it. You know, you have like a map of not only color, but different colors in different columns. And, uh, you know, different orientations. Uh, so, when in the textbooks, mo this is the main diagram you normally see when they talk about cortical columns. And again, they just talk about columns, you know, in the U1, but there's actually like 20 different kind of columns in animal models, but nobody's ever seen them in humans. And so, you know, one thing we mapped in the course of this is the ocular doms columns here. So, in V1, this is all the gray matter of V1, you see, uh, cells activated by the right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, and that, you know, there's like 200 of these columns all the way through V1. The key is, the, the problem is they're very small. This is one millimeter. So it's been a challenge. You can't really see these with conventional fMRI. So people had already sort of looked at ocular dominance columns and they kind of messed up the field, you know, by doing all kinds of different things, some of which are valid, some of which aren't. So we decided, well, we'll just go to the second visual area and look at the columns there and see if we can see those. And it turned out that that's a way, it's sort of, you can show things much better that way. So as background, this is just a histological slice from a monkey. This is V1, which I won't talk about much. But in V2, you can see in, with an enzyme stain, with an enzyme stain for cytochrome oxidase, you see different stripes. And again, this is histology, not fMRI. But you can see thin stripes of higher enzymatic activity. And than thin stripes between them of, of higher activity. And so a lot of studies in animals suggest that cells here respond really well to color, and these cells respond to 3D patterns, you know, uh, as opposed to two-dimensional patterns as if it was a photograph on a, on a, on a picture. So given that this, these distinct stripes occurred in, um, in monkey, we thought, well, maybe we'll look for them using the fMRI, see if we can see them. Again, the scale is challenging. Um, okay, so, and this is what we found, basically, when we stimulated with something like this, color minus luminance. Um, you see V1, and again, it's not much interesting to talk about there, but you also see these stripe-like patterns. 
uh, again, in a seven Tesla scanner where you can get a resolution of like a millimeter or less. Uh, and so these gave us the hint that these were maybe the thin stripes. Again, you can see them in the inflated view from the posterior of the cortex, and then this shows the, their full extent in the, um, in the flattened view. So they actually occur in V2 and they extend into V3 in the human. So, um, and this is just sort of walking backwards from the current uh, map of the color columns that we see in the seven Tesla back to this is what we would have seen or did see in the same subject when we test them at 3T with a little bit of spatial fil filtering, which is basically what everybody else is looking at. So um, you can see there's really no columns in V2 because they're just below the spatial resolution of the um, conventional fMRI. So again, this is just to remind you what the, the stripes look like. The key here I want to talk about is that um, in the animal work, the thin stripes, which we've labeled with the color, um, are interdigitated with other stripes that should be activated by three-dimensional uh, three stimuli as opposed to two-dimensional stimuli. So they're two completely different dimensions. Like if you did conventional fMRI, it would all be mixed together and you don't, you know, you actually, in, in those kinds of experiments, you don't see any real difference in V2. But here, you know, you can see very distinctly uh, what you would get. And so we were looking for interdigitated stripes that were responsive to 3D. And this is the kind of stimuli we used. You can't really show it because you need red-green glasses, you know, like in a 3D movie to see it. But the stimuli basically were, or it's as if you're looking at skyscrapers from above and also the skyscrapers are moving back and forth in 3D versus kind of a picture of the skyscrapers. And again, this is, um, you can ignore this for now. These are just ocular dominance columns done as a control in V1. But in V2, these areas here, you can see kind of distinct stripes. And so based on, if these are real columns and not some sort of hemodynamic artifact or something, these things should interdigitate. The color columns we activated earlier in the same subject should lie between these disparity columns. And basically, that's what we found. So this shows three different um, subjects. The color columns in subject one, two, and three. It shows the disparity columns in subject one, two, and three in the same location. Here, just for ease of comparison, we've drawn black lines around it, and then we've overlaid them here. So you can see the color columns shown as background are, show these yellow strips, and then the disparity columns lie, lie nicely between them. So again, that strongly shows that these are like real columns, um, and they're not some sort of hemodynamic artifact. And we've done a lot of other controls. So, um, Okay, so this is the final set of, set of data from the same kind of seven Tesla study. We showed that there are these interdigitating cortical columns tuned to color and disparity, two different visual dimensions. Um, so then in parallel, in the conventional fMRI, people have done a lot of studies using um, mapping what they call functional connections, which is basically you just have a subject lie there and they don't stare at any visual pattern, they just lie there uh, even with their eyes closed, which is how we measure them. And so, it, and in those functional connection studies, you can just see correlations between activity in different areas. So we took it one step further. We thought, well, if these things are really connected, like color columns in area one to color columns in area two to color columns in area three, uh, then we should be able to see them even we should be able to see preferential functional connections between the color regions and the disparity regions across areas, even in subjects with their eyes closed. And basically, I, I don't want to drag you through all the details, but basically, this shows exactly that data. Um, the, the double dissociation here is just indicating that the color columns here uh, are less preferentially connected to disparity columns, and color columns are more preferentially connected to, uh, okay, so. This is disparity column. So anyway, it's the double dissociation gives you what you're hoping to see. Uh, so that validates the functional connections on one hand as a possible reflection of actual neural connections. And also it, it brought, this study brought it to a level of, of much finer scale. You know, connections talking, I mean, co columns co talking to other columns in different areas rather than just area to area or site to site. So. That's basically all I wanted to talk to you about. But I mean, to me, looking back on it, back on it the, the gratifying thing is that we're able to, that the fMRI is still teaching us new things after 
24 years or something. That is, I mean, for a while it seemed to me, you know, in my own studies at least, I couldn't think of something new. But then, you know, there are probably columns, since there's columns in like 20 different visual areas, it's quite likely, I believe, that there's, it's a fundamental functional um, cortical architecture or feature, and so that hopefully we can, you know, my dream is to find different cortical columns tuned to, you know, like uh, advance or retract, you know, some sort of cognitive variable. And, but that's going to be harder, but it would be very cool if it happens. Thank you. <laughs>